and feel free to go ahead whenever you want. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, Julia. Thanks for having me today. And yes, I'm going to take the opportunity to present again what I tried to present in only five minutes at EGU, which was probably a bit short, since this is also a bit of a technical um, topic. And yeah, as the title already suggests, uh, it, it will become a little technical because I'm going to talk about a data-driven reconstruction of last glacial climate dynamics, which uh, suggests monostable Greenland temperatures and bistable Northern Hemisphere atmosphere. Um, so you might have already guessed that this is again about Danskir Oeschka events, uh, since we're talking about uh, monostable like Greenland temperatures and uh, Northern Hemisphere atmosphere. Um, by the way, you hear me well? Okay. And if there's any questions, please uh, interrupt me immediately. Don't, don't save them for the end of the talk. Um, okay, um, so let me first introduce you to the data that we have been analyzing in this work, and which is again the NGRIP record, and because we wanted to investigate Danskarischka events. Um, so you see here the Delta 18O record and the dust concentration record from the NGRIP ice core, whose location I've just like again reminded you of in the upper right corner, um, over the last uh, glacier, basically. And you see that both of these records show these very prominent abrupt transitions from one state to the other. And just um, be reminded that I've taken the logarithm of the dust concentrations and multiplied it by minus one, because then these two time series look very much alike. And if you don't do this, they look a little, little bit different. But so with this, you can see that there's that these two things are really uh, belong to one another and that these transitions, which you see in both time series, um, originate like or they they have the same origin. Um, so Danskat Oeschka events, um, you know this already, but these are um, temperature jumps of five to 16.5 um, increases over like in, in the annual mean temperature over Greenland. So we're talking about uh, this is regional. Um, and these um, jumps happened on decadal timescales. So we're talking about something about 100, of, 100 years of transition time. Like, from the cold state to the warmer state. And they are also accompanied by a reorganization of the Northern Hemisphere atmospheric circulation, um, which is indicated by the dust. So this dust, the, the dust that you find in the Angrip ice core mostly originates from Asian deserts. And depending on how the atmospheric circulation is, um, is set up, is configured, um, this dust can reach Greenland or it cannot. And this is why you see the, the sudden changes just as in the Delta 18O, you see them also in the dust. Um, then in addition to these two very prominent um, changes, which we see recorded here, like the temperature and the um, Northern Hemisphere atmospheric circulation, there is also a retreat of North Atlantic and Nordic seas sea ice, and there's also proxy evidence that the AMOC um, reinvigorates over these phases of, of milder Greenland climate. Um, and on the other hand, we have in the Antarctic, we have a cooling. And finally, there is a shift in the ATTZ because like the temperature gradients on the northern hemisphere change. And that, of course, affects also the position of the IT. Sorry, it should be ITZZ, right? Uh, so I can, can draw my T, Z, Z. Okay. Um, this is just like the, the, the background or the, the setting uh, with, which we are in. And now for our study, we have uh, zoomed into this data a little bit, as you can see on the bottom part of this plot. Um, and we have concentrated on, on this shorter time period because this is a time period which is characterized by fairly high 
frequency of DO variability. So there's many DO events within this time window. And it's on paleoclimate time scales is a fairly short time period, which allows us to assume that the background climate was more or less stable. Of course, this spans over almost 30,000 years. So we are, we're getting into, into orbital uh, time scales as well. And it, it's, of course, background climate is never stable, but it's fairly stable over this period of time. And we have uh, normalized the data by subtracting the mean and taking the uh, and dividing by the standard deviation. Um, so this is the piece of data that we've really taken and, and, and um, yeah, applied our method to. So we're gonna take this with us on the, onto the next slide. This is where the data analysis begins. Um, as I already said, we assume that the background climate is stable over this period of time. And then we treated these time series as the outcome of a Markovian process. Um, yeah, just be reminded. So Markovianity means that there is no, um, no memory term in the dynamics. And the, the next step only always depends on the, on the present state. So the, the, the past of a process doesn't matter. And um, oops, I can erase this. Um, yeah, so that's the first assumption that we have a Markovian process here. And as I said, we assume that there's um, stability of the background climate, which um, enables us to assume that the dynamics which gave rise to these time series are time homogeneous. So if we think of like some equations we would like to write down to, to produce um, these time series, then these equations wouldn't depend on time explicitly. And yeah, this is ensured by the short, short in parentheses, uh, time window. And of course, these assumptions, um, yeah, immediately imply that we're talking about some sort of a stochastic differential equation that we would like to associate with these, with these time series. Um, okay. Um, yeah, and so talking about stochastic differential equations, maybe yeah, one of the most famous ones is the Langevin equation. This one, um, which is characterized by a drift and a diffusion. And where the WT here denotes a Wiener process. And so this Langevin equation describes the mo or can this can be used to describe the motion of a particle in the presence of a of some sort of potential, and then of course this this diffusion term here just yeah we, uh, describes the noise which also acts on this particle, and this Langevin equation is immediately related to the Fokker-Planck equation. Um, which describes the probability density in the state space if the, the single, single particle motion is um, described by the Langevin equation. Um, what does that mean? That means if you look at the right-hand side here, I have, um, I have simulated many trajectories of, a, of, a, of particles which, which follow this Langevin equation where I've just set a to minus one and b to one. So a, a equals minus one, that um, gives us a, like a single, single well potential and b equal to one just tells us the, the strength of the noise. And then I've simulated this trajectory. The blue one is just one specific trajectory and all the others are like other random trajectories. And um, so this equation, gives us one of these trajectories, the blue one or one of those gray ones. And this equation, the Fokker-Planck equation, tells us how, how the red curve evolves over time. That is the, 
the probability density, um, these trajectories, like if, if you don't follow a single particular trajectory, it tells you how the probability density of such a process um, in this state space evolves. And yeah, so this is a very important relation between the, the Fokker Planck and the Langevin equation. Um, but of course, this is just a very particular stochastic process, and the Langevin equation is a very, a very particular um, stochastic differential equation. And in our analysis, we um, went, so to speak, one one step further, and employed an even more general uh, concept, which is the concept of the kramers moyal equation, which is also the title of this slide. And um, yeah, and now you, you, you might focus brief uh, for a second on, on the title of the two boxes, namely the, the one, the, one uh, the box that introduced the Langevin equation is entitled with, uh, has the title continuous stochastic process because the Langevin equation gives rise to trajectories which are continuous in time, but then there might also be discontinuous stochastic processes. So think of a process which is like mostly governed by the Langevin equation, like for example, a jump diffusion process. So you can see here, this is again, just the same terms as in the Langevin equation, but then you could add something like Poissonian jumps, for example. So every now and then your trajectory gets, or your, your, your marble in the, in the potential well receives a kick. And that kick is, is like outstanding from, from the typical kicks that it, that it feels like all the time from the noise. Um, and this, this term, this last term would make the trajectory of such a process discontinuous with respect to time because suddenly you can, you can jump over like larger distances in state space from one instance to the other. And okay, so we have the, uh, we've talked about the Langevin equation and its relation to the Fokker-Planck equation. And now um, with this example of a discontinuous stochastic process, there is the more general concept of the kramers moyal equation, which describes the evolution of such processes, um, which describes now the, the evolution of the um, probability density in state space of such discontinuous stochastic processes. And you see that here in this sum, the first two terms are again just, they give again just rise to the Fokker Planck equation, but then there are higher order terms. Um, and these higher order terms, hence, are directly related to the presence of such discontinuities. So we have here d1, uh, d1 and d2. d0 is just the, 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 um, the, the PDF of a process. But d, sorry, uh, d1 and d2 are, again, the Fokker-Planck equation related to a and b. But then this term gives rise to the to everything m greater than two. Mm, yeah, maybe it's important to really make sure. So we're really talking about Markovian processes only. So this whole theory only holds for Markovian processes. Um, in this example, which, which I have given, the, like the jump diffusion process, you can again relate all these coefficients, these um, d1, d2, and d with some higher order, you can relate them to the process coefficients. So you would again find that d1 is proportional to the drift to A, d2 is proportional to the diffusion, but now there is also already a contribution from, from, the, from the jumps. And but all the higher order terms are proportional to yeah, this, this uh, term which, which arises solely from the jumps. And maybe, sorry, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, you have a corresponding 
um, relation for for the Fokker-Planck equation, of course. Okay, with this, I think I've talked enough about this uh, Kramers Moyal equation. I, sorry, I have to erase this again before going to the next slide. Um, yeah, so here we have again the Kramers Moyal equation, this one. Um, and now the good thing is that we can estimate these coefficients or called Kramers Moyal coefficients, these dMs. And these dMs are simply um, the moments of, of, those are the moments of the distribution of increments when you go from x t, x at the time t, to x at the time t plus tau. Um, this formula might look a little bit complicated. I will try to give you an intuition for what's going on here. Um, so first, this is an increment from xt to xt plus tau, but you would, um, you, you would condition this on x at the time t should be equal to some x, or this could be some x0. Um, so, and this is the same x as the x that you put in here. Um, now look at the bottom left corner. Um, so there you would, for example, in order to estimate these things from data, you would um, condition or you would take all the points in your time series where your time series has this specific value of x. So these are all the red dots. And then you would see where does your time series go from that point in the time tau. So after some time tau, in this example, uh, equal to 0 0.1, you move from the red to the green dot in, in, this, in this bottom left plot. And then you get increments, like here you move from there to there, move from there to there, from there to there, and so on. And this gives you a distribution of increments which is shown on the right-hand side. Um, and now this, this term is just, it, yeah, it's just the expectation of, uh, yeah, it's, it's just the, the moments of a distribution. And um, then finally, what you do is that you let go tau. So this time step, you take this to zero. And that these are the, so-called Kramers Moyal coefficients. So just that you have an idea like how one can estimate these from, from data. And this is practically what we have done um, with a time series from the n-group record that we have estimated these dms. Okay. And with this, um, I can move on to the results. So I have to erase again all the notes I've been taken. <laughs> So we have estimated these dms um, from the two time series. And you see here the results for the 1D case, where we have analyzed the two time series, the delta 18O and the dust individually and separately. And we have estimated these uh, coefficients, d1, d2, d4, d3. Um, and here you can see now that first, um, the first row shows the, the PDF of, of, the de of the dust on the left-hand side and of the Dell 18 on the right-hand side. And um, I will first discuss the results for the dust. So going from top to bottom, you see in the first row, the, the PDF, and you already see that the dust um, shows some, some bimodality. So there's two pronounced maxima in the, in the dust PDF. And then the D1, which is, um, if you think back to the slide where I introduced the, the Fokker-Planck equation and so on, the D1 is always the, the deterministic drift of, um, of this process. And you see here that this drift is actually bistable because it has two zero crossings. So this is maybe, yeah, you could say something proportional to some minus X 
to the power of three plus x, something like that. Um, and you have defined the two stable points in the drift, which match with the maxima that we see in the PDF. Um, the next row is simply, yeah, just the, the integral over this drift, which just gives you a potential, which I always find more, more um, easy to just for sake of visualization, because you can always think of a marble which rolls down a hill and which would then settle in at the bottom of the well, but it doesn't contain any additional information. Um, the next row is the D2. So that's in the case of the Langevin equation and, and the Fokker Planck equation, that's the diffusion. We have seen that in the case where the process is actually non continuous, it contains more. Um, uh, how do you say more contributions from from the jumps as well um, but here we find that this d2 is mostly stable within a certain range um, which tells us that actually there is some sort of um, additive noise so we don't have state dependent noise here in the system and then finally the last row is um, oops is the ratio of d4 over d2 and i've told you that the d4 is actually something which is associated with um with discontinuities and probably jumps and we see here that this ratio is fairly small so it's it, it it's in the regime where the time series spends a lot of time it 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 doesn't exceed 0 0.05 which is small value for us. And hence, we conclude that for the case of the dust, those jumpy elements or discontinuous elements in the stochastic differential equation don't, don't play a large role. They can be neglected. And thus, we conclude that the dust is actually bistable and continuous. So that's for the dust. Now, moving on to the delta 18O. First of all, we see in contrast to the dust that this time series now is monostable in, in its PDF, uh, sorry, monomodal. I didn't mean to say stable at this point, but going to the next row, we also see that it is also monostable, which is a bit surprising if you think of the time series that I've showed you in the beginning. They look pretty much alike, but we have very qual qualitatively different results here. So, Reconstructing the drift, we only find a single stable fixed point. Um, then again, we have the potential, which carries no further information. And finally, um, we have the noise, which are the diffusion, the D2, which is a lot higher for the del 18 o than for the dust. But again, it is fairly stable. So again, one could argue that this is additive noise. But then, Importantly, going to the last row, here we have again the D4 over the D2, which is one order of magnitude larger for the del 18 o than for the dust. And thus we would conclude that the del 18 o is monostable and also at the same time discontinuous. So we say that there is something which goes beyond like continuous white noise driven process. Yeah, and that's basically our results for the one-dimensional case. And we have carried out this analysis also for the two-dimensional case. So this is where we go now. Um, so what do I mean for the two-dimensional case? It's, it's just that these, these equations, like what I've told you about the Langevin equation and the Fokker-Planck equation and the kramers moyal um, equation, of course, also applies when you consider dust and del 18 o as just two components of a vector valued time series. So you just have a two dimensional time series evolving over time, then, of course, these equations apply as well and these concepts. And here, um, let me guide you through this um, plot because that contains um, a lot of information. Well, first on the um, upper left, 
you just see all the data points that we have in state space. And um, we have uh, drawn those points in blue, which correspond, oh, sorry, I think that's a mistake. So this is Greenland state yields and this is Greenland interstate yields, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Um, should be like this. Um, and then you can reconstruct the, yeah, and, and you can reconstruct the drift of, of this, um, uh, you, you have the two dimensional um, time series, a vector value time series. And then just as for the one dimensional case, you can compute um, the, the drift um, of this time series, which is then shown here in panel B. And you can already see in panel B that we have two regions of convergence, so where the arrows are pointing. And those are these two reason, regions, and they exactly correspond to the Greenland stadiates and to the Greenland interstadiates. And in between them, we have, uh, yeah, we have um, something which is, it's not really a region of divergence, but that's a, it's a region of, of um, actually, there is an unstable fixed point in this, in this drift. And now you can also decompose this drift into the drift along the either of the two directions. And this is shown in panels C and D. And um, there you find that actually, if you, so that is like panel C and D answer the question, like you have this two dimensional time series. And if you, if you now keep, say you keep del 18 fixed, and then you ask like, where would the system move along the dust direction? Then this is shown in panel C. So it's only the motion in the dust direction, while panel D answers the question, say you are at a given point in state space and you keep the dust fixed, where would the system move in the del 18 O direction? So this is how these two um, plots must be understood. And here we say, uh, here we see that for the dust actually, yeah, it, it resembles a little bit of a double fold bifurcation. And this is, yeah, an, an interesting feature because a double fold bifurcation always gives the opportunity to, to induce um, abrupt transitions from one state to the other. Um, so, like, this would offer the a possible path to, to go from, from one um, region of convert or like from, from one basin of attraction to the other by um, if, if you're somewhere here in the system and you, you just accidentally or like by noise move the del 18 to this point, then you could imagine that this stable branch actually ends here and then you would move up or the other way around, you're here and if a random perturbation in the del 18 would move you there, then you're crossing a bifurcation in the dust only, and then you should move uh, to this lower stable branch. Um, yeah, and, but, so what we definitely see is that the, that the bi-stability that we have already seen in the one-dimensional case um, is preserved also in this two-dimensional setting in case of the dust. So the dust is again um, bistable and it resembles a double fold bifurcation. Yeah, and which would be controlled, so to speak, by the delta 18O. For the case of the delta 18O drift, we see again that this is always monostable, like no matter what is the value for the dust, the delta 18O only has one stable fixed point and would always go there. And so this is also in agreement with what we've already seen in the one dimensional case. Um, and with this, I'm already coming to my legs, uh, to my last slide. Um, 
So to conclude, um, we have the Delta A, we have investigated Delta eighteen O and dust from the NGRIP ice core, and with Delta eighteen O representing Greenland temperatures, we find that the Delta eighteen O time series is in fact not inherently bistable, but it is monostable. And we like we have the, the time series of the Delta 18O, we know that this has two regimes. And we would now say that these two regimes, um, they only can arise from the coupling to the dust. And this also seems plausible because like if you have a climate system and you keep all the parameters fixed, you wouldn't expect the temperature to have two different potentially stable states with everything else being, being fixed. On the other hand, we have the dust, which kind of represents the atmospheric circulation state. And we see that the dust is actually inherently bistable. And this also seems plausible since there is evidence for bistability of the jet stream, for example. Um, yeah, and also again, if you have a climate system and you keep all parameters fixed, it's more easily to, to imagine an atmospheric circulation which has two different states within within the same where the rest is is um, has, remains in the same configuration. Um, that's that's um, more easily to to imagine than than the temperature having two different states while the rest is is kept constant. Um, and the third important um, conclusion here from our work is that delta eighteen O. Um, must actually be regarded as a discontinuous process and it potentially has jumps and these jumps are potentially related to DO events. This is something that we haven't shown in this study or we, we couldn't because this will um, require us to write down an explicit um, process model, which we haven't done. Um, and also the source of these discontinuities um, cannot be revealed within our analysis. And yeah, I would also like to uh, disclose the, the caveats about our approach, um, which is, I mean, of course, Delta 18, the, the records of Delta 18O and dust are functions of a very high dimensional state space of the climate system. And probably they don't tell the whole story. So probably we are missing, we are missing some parts of the dynamics when only looking at this, at these two variables. Um, next is we find indication for Markovianity of both two time series, but it is difficult to prove, like if you're given just a time series, it's difficult to prove that um, this time series actually was generated in a Markovian process. And finally, um, yeah, as always in, in paleoclimate, <laughs> yeah, in paleoclimates, I think more data would be desirable, both in terms of higher resolution and also in terms of additional proxy variables. And yeah, I think with this I'm I'm done. And which I I am okay. So this is important because here you can see my my co-authors, which are uh, Leonardo Ridin and Furu and Dirk Witthout, Pedro Lind, and Niklas Börs. Yeah, they are 